Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 10K, where we're going to talk about small chromosome differences. Small, well, first we'll talk about detecting differences that are smaller than the ones we've been describing so far, but which are still very large, and then about ways to detect very small differences. And then we'll consider the range of the differences that are being found, how frequent they are in our genomes, and their causes. When um, geneticists first became able to visualize chromosomes under the microscope by looking at them during mitosis when they're condensed. They couldn't see much at all. They were just threads. But then they developed techniques for staining them with particular dyes that stained some parts of the chromosome more brightly than others. And refinements of this technique gave them a way to generate recognizable distinct banding patterns on the different chromosomes. Um, an idealization of that is shown on the right, no, on the left. Um, you've seen these throughout the course. However, the bands do not correspond to genes, as I've said, and the resolution was only 5 to 10 megabases. That's 5 to 10 million base pairs long. Subsequently, they developed techniques of fluorescent microscopy, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. Um, where by tagging particular DNA fragments with fluorescent dyes that would glow under ultraviolet light in different colors, they were able to use base pairing to match these, to get these DNA probes, they were called, to bind to the corresponding places on the chromosomes. This allowed researchers to detect the presence or absence of specific sequences on specific chromosomes. Here's an example of the kind of karyotyping that you get using the standard dye technique. You can see that there are lots of bands, and I think you can imagine that a skilled cytogeneticist would be able to recognize the patterns of the bands and say, well, that's chromosome 8, and that's chromosome 9. Here is an example of the technique being used diagnostically. This is a child who has a deletion of, in one of the copies of chromosome 4, and they're lined up like that, and it's indicated by the arrow that this segment of chromosome 4 is missing. But you can see that the resolution is pretty poor, given that, for instance, chromosome 4 is 186 megabases long. Here is the fluorescence technique. Um, it can be used in two different ways. One is to look for one or more specific genes. Um, this is particularly powerful for detecting deletions. So in this case, we're looking at both normal chromosomes in metaphase, when the chromosomes are condensed for mitosis, and in a normal interphase cell, when the chromosomes are very diffuse. And here we can easily see the two probes they're using. There are two green dots there and there, and two red dots, whoop, back, two red dots there and there, indicating the two copies of each gene that's being tested. Now these two genes are both present on chromosome 22, and here's what you see when you look at a patient who's, one of whose chromosome 22s carries a deletion. You can see that both of the chromosome 22s Here's one, here's the other, have the green gene present, but only one of the chromosome 22s has the red gene present. And that's seen more clearly in the diffuse chromosomes where there's only one red spot, but two very clear green spots. So this is diagnostic for saying this red gene has been deleted in this chromosome. The technique can also be used in a at what's often called chromosome painting. In this technique, sequences are isolated from individual chromosomes, which are separated using a special technique. That DNA, the DNA of each chromosome is tagged with a different fluorescent dye so that each chromosome lights up a different color, at least when you assign false colors to the different wavelengths that your microscope can detect. And here is a karyotype that's been assembled using 
a set of painted chromosomes where each distinct chromosome is a slightly different color. Now these are both very low resolution techniques. Much more powerful techniques can be done using purified DNA. You're already familiar with the use of SNP chips. These allow the presence or absence of SNP alleles to be detected, but not the dosage. So the, the technique can't tell whether you are heterozygous, whether you have only one copy of a particular SNP or two copies. A more sophisticated technique called competitive genome hybridization can be used to test the dosage either of SNP alleles or of other segments of the chromosome. And it will detect the dosage. It can tell the difference between one copy or two copies or usually three copies. And in the very, very best hands, it gives a resolution of between 5 and 10 KB. That's smaller than a gene, but it's still pretty big, 5 to 10,000 nucleotides. The highest resolution comes from direct sequencing, which can resolve single base pairs. Now, I'm not going to show you how these techniques are done, but I'm going to describe some results. This is results from a project called the Thousand Genomes Project. And in this particular use of these genomes, the researchers sequenced 183 unrelated individuals to see what kinds of variation they had. And they found, in these 183 individuals, they found more than 10 to the 7th SNPs. They found 10 to the 6th short insertions or deletions. So that's, you know, 500 per person, 5,000 per person. That's 10 to the 2, 10 to the 6, 5,000 per person. And they found 20,000 larger variants. This very complicated graph here shows the distribution, of the size distribution and the frequency of what they found with big deletions down here. These are deletions that are more than 100 kilobases big insertions up here. You can see that both of these were fairly rare. But then as the deletions they were looking at got smaller and smaller, their numbers got higher and higher. Note that this is a log scale. So this is 10 to the 1. That's about 10. 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million. You can see that when they came down to small insertions and deletions, there were at least a million of each. Most of these had never been seen before. They're all relatively rare. Now, we can ask, well, which processes created these small differences? And the answer is all of the processes that we discussed in the previous lectures were responsible. So about 10% of them were created by slippage at VNTR repeats, the short sequence repeats that are also used for DNA fingerprinting. Many, many of them, more than 40%, were created by non-homologous end joining, the random joining of broken DNA fragments without regard for which ends actually belong together. 23% arose by insertion of mobile elements, which we're going to discuss in an upcoming lecture, and about 22% arose by non-allelic homologous recombination, which we also just discussed. So these processes not only create the very large rearrangements that we talked about earlier, they also create hundreds of thousands and millions of smaller differences that until we had advanced techniques, we didn't even know were present in our genome. So we've considered different methods of characterizing differences in chromosome structure, old-fashioned methods with low resolution but relatively economical and efficient, to high-tech, very modern methods that can go right down to base pair differences. And we considered the amounts and of variation of different kinds in our genome. Basically, there's a lot. And it's created by the same processes that create the larger variation that's much more rare but easier to study. Coming up next, we're going to think about mobile DNA. I hope to see you there.